to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about what I referenced yesterday um, regarding those people that Jude says crept in unawares. I called them creeps. But this can't be emphasized enough. I think sometimes isolating a passage and if we're just isolating something. It's a wonderful study, but then when you start to look at other places where other instances are saying the same thing, you really realize that the danger, not only in the early church, but as I said, the church today, the danger hasn't gone away. Anybody who studies church history will find that not only has the danger taken on different shades and color through the ages, but it's the same spirit at work. So I, we studied yesterday those um, that Jude is referencing. Certain men crept in unawares. And what is interesting and equally tragic is if you read what the Apostle Paul said in Acts 20, he's warning the Ephesian elders of something. If you want to turn there, I want to just kind of pick this apart a little bit. They're all things you've read before, but it seems kind of terrible when you see this is what was going on early on. Uh, Acts 20 Paul tells them how he was serving the Lord with all humility of mind, many tears, temptations which befell me by the lying weight of the Jews, how I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. If you keep reading, he says, I have... Verse 27, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And So you get the idea. He's warning them. He says, when I leave, this is going to happen. And there's no question that it happened. And there's no question that seemingly compare this with what I referenced out of Galatians. It just seems to me that we can be, um, you can get into the mindset that this is historically past. Even though we know what's around us and we can observe but we don't really think that the danger is as real and present, perhaps, as it was in their day. No, it's worse. And Paul is saying, when I leave, this is going to happen. To the Galatians, Galatians 2, in verse 4, he says, And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. And if you keep looking, you'll find references over and over. There are references to these in a perhaps a more vague way uh, in Corinthians. And you've got a different type of mention 
This is what's interesting. If, you know, if you're really wanting to look and you see that there was no place where people could, well, out of Timothy's writing, uh, Paul writing to Timothy, specifically to him, to a church, and he says, again, he's telling, Paul is telling Timothy, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words, to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. And he says, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And if you keep reading, he talks about how, um, he says, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. Um, all of his instruction, then he says, now, in the last days, perilous times shall come, men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Keep going. The most important thing he says here is verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So from every angle you want to look. Moreover, keep going, you find that Peter will write something, um, we'll say somewhat similar. They all start to sound the same. Second uh, Peter 2 could actually have started a little bit early, but I'll start here. There are false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Past tense, present tense. Who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. You just It's somewhat interesting because... Um, this section actually in 2 Peter has a parallel to Jude. That's why I said you can almost do a side by side and there's been a lot of debate as to if Jude was privy to see or hear what was in 2 Peter or not. I don't want to get into that tonight, but you can see that they're all saying the same thing. They're all lamenting and that's just the New Testament. We could go into the Old Testament and look at the words when we studied, I don't know if you remember, out of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is saying, you know, they come and they, they're speaking peace, peace, but there is no peace. Ezekiel confronted the same thing. It's an age-old problem. But you would think with the establishment of the church in this very early, early stage, we're looking at, um, I'm going to say, no more than 30 maybe 40 years at best in the span of the um, earthly ministry of Christ to the close, uh, if John's writing, we'll just say if we put it at the late date of 98, or some put it at 99, but I'll say 98, we're talking at best a span of perhaps 60 years. And even John was writing about these things in first. Uh, John. So you've got every single writing in the New Testament is confronting the same problem. And I think my attraction to this little epistle of Jude is that there, there, there isn't any other message going on here. You know, if you read Paul, he may address the issue of people who crept in, but then it's stand fast in the liberty wherewith you've been called and maybe some other things that might be addressed, extreme doctrinal pegs out of Paul's writing. Here, it's simply a warning to the faithful to keep the faith and to not be persuaded. I love what, um, as I referenced out of Acts 20, what Paul said about how when these individuals come in, they will also speak evil and say malicious things as to draw disciples away from you. That still goes on today. That's age old. And the call for us 
it can't be said enough. I may sound like, you know, some voice crying in the wilderness, but can't be sounded enough to be vigilant. Oh, how easy it is for people who do not have a deep rooted understanding or they're not deep into the Bible. It's just a surface, you know, it's a casual reader. One of their friends says, oh, hey, you got to listen to this teacher. Now, that may, that may be a wonderful Bible teacher, but most of the time those, hey, you got to listen to this, is the quintessential feel-good, massage yourself, save yourself, do for yourself, be for yourself. No Bible. And I hate to sound repetitive, but we know without faith it's impossible to please God, and faith only comes by hearing the Word of God. And when people say, well, I have faith, well, I don't want to sound like James when I say this, but uh, I don't want to say, show me your works. I want to say, tell me how much Bible you know, though. I've had people say, well, you know, I don't, I don't need to study the Word of God to have faith. Well, that's, that's a different type of thing. We're talking about saving faith, and you can only say you know about that through the Word. You can't know it just through osmosis or through some mystical... You get what I'm saying. So the point is, one of the reasons why I'm, I have this um, new excitement for this small little epistle is it is a call, and it should be a modern-day clarion call to those who understand what they've received, how they received it. And when I say how they've received it, if it's really of God, it doesn't come easy. You know, the, the, the learning and the frustration that comes with having to walk by faith and not by sight. And even when you've learned the lessons, how many times do you get knocked down and you have to get back up again in the, that We'll call it the need to keep getting back up, which is lifelong. It doesn't come easy. The salvation itself, which is free, we receive it freely, we do nothing to merit it. But it's a struggle. This is why I love the Greek word, Paul writing, agonize the good agony, fight the good fight of faith, because it is not just a... a if you want to call it a hand-to-hand -hand combat, mano a mano, it is, it's agonizing daily. The things we're confronted with that could very easily, it's very easy to start leaning on the flesh. It's very easy and extremely subtle. The things that we are given in exchange for simply trusting God and taking Him at His word, that He will do what He said because He has in the past, He will in the present, and He will in the future. So this is definitely, a, for me, this is a wonderful place to talk about this, how not just uh, in a diversity of places that I've highlighted, the scriptures that I've referenced, uh, one of the places where it says, you know, don't give heed to um, cunning fables and genealogies. I'm, listen, I'm all for the study of things that will build up your faith and my faith if they are a complement to the Bible, I have no problem with that. But I've yet to see, I've yet to see this in all the things and the people I've been exposed to who go down these, what I'd call secondary roads, that get sucked into them like a vortex. And then suddenly, their excitement is for these other things, not for the Bible. And it's a danger. When Paul talks about the, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices, well, even the most learned people can become blindsided by Satan's devices. It's so much easier, especially in our day and age, go look on the internet. If you're a little bit lazy, all you got to do is put in a keyword and up comes, you know, There'll be several different experts who are all going to tell you some different thing about the thing you're looking for. I have a friend of mine to give you an idea, and I, I digress from this for a second, just to give you an idea of how I see the confusion of the Internet, a great blessing 
and also a great curse. I have a friend of mine who was diagnosed with stage three kidney disease not too long ago. And of course, you start the journey to try and find what an individual with this type of diagnosis can eat or not eat. Not, we're not talking about sodium and potassium, we're talking about foods that are labeled as bad and taxing the body. And I did my own little research, it was very brief, I searched maybe 12 or 15 different sites, printed out a ton of stuff and I was, there was conflicting information one says, yes, you can eat this, and the other says, no, you can't eat that. And one says, you can do this, and the other one says, no, you can't do that. Now, come back to the spiritual, because it is exactly like that. When people are looking up things on the Internet. By and large, there's so much contradiction. There are a lot of people. Everybody sounds like an expert. And the tragedy is, for the people who are really looking, what do you think happens? Usually... It's the thing that requires the least amount of work that sounds the most plausible, that's the most comfortable avenue that's taken. Tell me that's not so. That's the way it works. So you're trying to find your way, if you're someone who feels like they're searching, you're trying to find your way, and somebody says, look, the first thing you need to do is you need to find love. That's the, sorry, that's the common theme. I'm not suggesting that that's bad, but that's the common theme when people are beginning to search and they're trying to figure out how do I put the, the puzzle pieces together for my life. So uh, all of these spiritual experts, love, love, love. Of course, one of the most commonly quoted things, God is love. Unfortunately, that's not what you need first. You'll, you're, you're getting love by God if God guides you to a right place. And usually the thing you'll get first is some tough love. To be confronted with the ugliness of yourself. Not to be told you're good and you're great and you can be coddled and stroked and petted. The tough love of, of someone saying, here, I'm not going to hold up the mirror for you. You pick up the mirror for yourself in this book and find how ugly you are. And I'm talking about spiritually deprived, you're not a good person. This is all the preachments out there. You're a good person, and good, good things happen to good people. Well, I'd like to know how that was applicable to the followers of Christ when they all died except for John, terrible deaths. I'm, is that a good thing that happened? This is why you, know, you can take slivers of this and make a modern day application of the heretical, and it is heretical, doctrines, the prosperity people out there, and they're still out there. You know, I can now say it, and I don't think there's any harm, but uh, with the likes of uh, Rufus Glitter Teeth and others who have been taken off the planet here, You'd think, well, you know, there's less of those. Oh, no, 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 no. Th those were tame now in comparison to the next generation. It's like um, the snakes that Pop Scott talked about in his vision, you know, hitting, this, the, hitting them down, they pop up somewhere else, except these are multiplied infinitely worse because they have the appearance of spiritual, because they speak in such a way, smooth and flattering. This is exactly what the Bible says. And you try and explain this to me, because I, I still haven't found an explanation except mm, probably the best one is P.T. Barnum's, but putting that aside, sucker born every minute, how is it possible that mass multitudes of people are deceived? Mass multitudes. You know, every single, I would say every year, every second, third year, there's some new healing evangelist that's out there healing, and people say, oh, you have to go to so-and-so's meeting. It's people are getting healed. Now, the one guy that came out uh, 
you know, he was the popular guy for a while. And people lined up. I'm not talking about the white suited one either. I'm talking about this was a newer, this guy was, I've told you the story before, full, you know, full of tats and he was very accepted uh, in the Christian community, I think because he came out and he was covered in tattoos and he looked like, you know, just average Joe out on the street. And so people related to him. Of course, he had these great, I'm talking about swelling, 20 and 30,000 people show up for healing services, which unfortunately, like all of these, turn out to be it may start in a good thing. It may start with a, a small group of people that he's preaching to that get the faith, but then it, it snowballs into something that it isn't. And people are being made merchandise, being sold. You've got to buy the book, and you've got to buy the tape, and you need this now, and you've got to come into the healing convention, conference, whatever, wherever it's being held. It's a $50 admission to get in and they'll still take up an offering and then there'll still be more merchandising. I, you know, t-shirts, I got healed at, you know, da, da, da. <laughs> I personally prefer the, you know, my friends went to such and such a place and all they got me was this stupid t-shirt. That'd be <laughs> way better, be way better. But when you think about it, though, what is it that draws people out to those type of events? Now, we've said this, I've said this before, desperation, possibly. But I'm, I'm going to say the root cause of why mass multitudes go has to be a lack of being in this book. Because I, I do believe that there have been people who have had a gift, a healing ministry, but they've been very few and very far in between. And I'm, I'm somewhat of a skeptic on all of these things. I'm not, my faith is rock solid. I believe in the great physician. I believe when he said, I am the Lord who healeth thee and I, he heals all diseases. I believe that. I amen that. There's, there's absolutely no question in my mind that there isn't anything that he cannot do, heal, deliver, break from bondage. There's no question in my mind. I just don't know when people come out and they start having these uh, events and they, be, they become somewhat of a spectacle. So I have to say it's the same thing again where people are not rooted in something, they'll go. Now, I've said, quoted the Bia Berean, that's study the word, see what the word says. Is it possible for someone to have the gift of healing? Absolutely. Paul talks about this, and I believe it. I'm not saying it was just then in his day. I believe it. You know, like it's like the, the, the guy who... His claim to fame, I've told you this before too, his claim to fame is that he, in his service, I always have trouble keeping a straight face, like the smile's already coming, he raised somebody from the dead. And my thinking is that probably his sermon was pretty boring. <laughs> it's just highly possible that the guy just collapsed then and there, and I don't know. problem is this one individual who that's their claim to fame wait for it the person that was dead was never certifiably dead in other words there was no death certificate issue there was no uh, there's a there's a lot of strange stories that surround that individual's supposed death now if somebody died in front of me, and you know, there's certain ways to tell if somebody's really dead, a pulse might help, right? Let's just say they're dead. And somebody who knows 
CPR or somebody was a doctor, yep, they're dead. And I don't know, a couple of days from that moment, not a couple hours, a couple of days, I see that person again. <laughs> I'm going to be like, wow, and what's going on? And how'd you do that? But you know what I'm saying? This sensationalizing, spectacularizing, and if that's the claim to fame, here's my question. Because I've heard this over and over again. This minister so-and-so raised this individual from the dead. Not God raised up this individual. It's always like that. I mean, God can function and does through human conduits, but this is, this is why I said all these things bring me back to, uh-uh. And I'm not saying God prove it. I, I, I'm good. Because I believe God can give very unique gifts to people. But don't be gullible. Like somebody saying, I have the call of God on my life. I'm, I'm picking these down the line here tonight because I figure this is just a good opportunity to go through these and uh, check some boxes off. I feel the call of God in my life. And the disturbing thing is when somebody says that and they haven't had what I've called a unique call of God. All they've had is a rebellious spirit and a refusal to serve under somebody else. So they want to go out and be their own, what they think is a cowboy for Jesus. Stiff neck, unbreakable, I'm, I'm, but, but the Lord called me. And I've said to you, it's always going to be like this. That God will, when God calls somebody, it'll usually be in a very unique way and that person will have their own burden and as I analyze even thinking about Dr. Scott, in the very early days, before he came here as pastor to Faith Center, he had some very unique, I want to say they were un unique for him, comparatively that he ended up settling down and spending 30 years thereafter. But as a missionary and traveling the world, which I'm not going to say was uncommon in his day because missions were very popular. I don't, they're not as popular today because it seems like unless you're in a very large, larger denomination that's still supporting missions, it's not like it was in his day. But that coupled with the fact that in his day, Think about this, because I don't think I've even put this in proper perspective. It was assumed that if you felt that you were called by the Lord, you went into the ministry, which basically was you couldn't do anything else, so you went to serve God. That was the mindset of Dr. Scott's era. So what a novel thing that he would go and get higher education. In his generation, I mean, there were doctors, but in his generation, that was kind of not really the big thing, because anybody could be, essentially, if you were in the family of the pastor, if you were related to somebody, if you had connections, and I'm not talking about the God ones, you could be serving the Lord very easily, because you couldn't get work doing anything else. So he did have a special burden placed on his life. And then when he came here, it, was, it seemed like the burden was to be a financial consultant and solve the problems here. That's another unique and special burden to him. And thereafter, it was fighting for the church's rights, which was a special burden to him. If you think about it, I'm not talking about Bible teaching per se, because that's a given. That's the heart and soul of any minister that is called. 
but each will have its own, his or her own unique burden, which is why I kind of still look back at the days when I said I was going into the prisons, and I remember the people who were very uh, outspoken and so, well, Dr. Scott never did that, and you know, we don't like that, and you know, we're, we're not going to be subject to that. I didn't subject you to it, and he didn't ask you to support me. I said, I'm going. I didn't ask for your permission. The Lord placed that burden. Believe me, I don't think I would have come up with that idea. Oh, I think I'm going to go to prison. <laughs> don't think so. And the strangest connections that were made that then just, it snowballed out of control to where I was traveling I was on the road more often than I was here um, working in the institutions and absolutely loved it and still love that work. I'm just at the point in my life where I can't, I can't do everything and more importantly right now or there, there are things right here that need my attention where I cannot be gone as often. And I understand that's my priority is here. But just, you know, as I pick these off, you might say, absolutely. The, the way these um, obstacles come into the church can be very subtle. This is why I use the word, translating the word for crept in, unaware is that word for crept in. I actually did a little bit more looking, and at least three references say coming in by a side door, which is very interesting. Not, not a back door. That would mean that the people were absolutely unaware, but they came in a side door, you can see. But you just didn't, and oh, okay, My brother's coming in the church, oh, no big deal. Paul's warning, as I said, of those who would come in and try to take disciples away, which still happens. People still do that. They leave and or they're disgruntled and they want to take other people with them so that they can start their own little uh, ministry of misery, instead of it being one of servitude and serving the Lord and preaching the word, it has to be, well, we're just going to get even. We're mad. We're going to get even. We're, we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it, right? Because God forbid you should actually read what Paul says in Ephesians 4.32, putting aside all malice, forgiving another one, or one another for Christ's sake. God forbid we should actually live by these things or let them live in our hearts and meditate on them. And this is why, by the way, the church, for the most part, is not taken seriously by the world. Although the world is controlled by a different force, but they look at the church and it's a joke. You remember many years ago, the um, Senator Grassley's investigation, and one of, the, one of the ministers on the list with the, I don't know if it was a 20 or a $30,000 commode, which some people said it might be a potty and other people said it might be a place to put clothes. Who knows what that meant when you used the word commode? The world's looking on saying, see, bunch of thieves, crooks. And these are people, by the way, I'm, I, I'm right in the middle. I say moderation. Don't be putting the minister in the position to have to be walking around with, with the handout trying to figure out how to make ends meet, nor don't be so over the top that you're, all, you're working on, like this one guy is working on his second or his third plane that he's acquired for his ministry because when he travels, he said he's like the president. He has to be in one plane and the rest of the people in his entourage have to go in another. I think those type of people need a healing mental healing from the Lord. Uh, I wouldn't say why this waste, I'd say why this stupidity. But everything in moderation, I can, I can completely understand. Somebody said to me, what do you feel about people who, ministries and people who have planes and travel in private jets? I don't, I don't feel anything. If you're, if you're on the road that frequently and your ministry supports that, then do it. Because at some point it becomes almost impossible. I'm a victim of this, and most of you have probably been victims of the same thing. You're on a deadline to get somewhere. You've got to be somewhere. You've given yourself more than enough room, 
and the flight that you're on has been canceled. Not once, not twice, maybe even three times, maybe come back tomorrow because there are no planes flying in the direction you need to go today. That's happened to me. And I've lamented and said, oh, if only Newman had a plane, <laughs> he'd let me borrow it. Just saying, I can understand, but moderation. But I can understand the world looking on and saying, what is this? Or the wackiness. As I've told you, if you ever watch some of these programs on TV, it's absolute wackiness. Like, I have to sit and say, what did they just say? It's not that they were speaking in tongues, because that's equally offensive to me. Not the speaking in tongues, but the doing it on TV. But what did they just say? Because it's just like, for anybody who's actually who's got half a brain, nothing intelligent was said. And then it cuts to a, like a mini infomercial about, you know, buy this right now, send away, rush your special love gift right now. How could you be that ignorant as to fall for that? Now, I'm, I'm just going on old pet peeves, but the list continues. And I didn't start it. I'm very grateful it's right in front of me. And I'm, I'm just trying to say this gives me the license to kind of once again make this call. Whoever will listen to this, whoever will hear it, there's going to come a day. And, you know, we can deceive ourselves and we can say we live in the now or that's then, I'll deal with it then. But there will come a day where we're all going to have to stand and give account. And I'm going to be the first person to say, Lord, I blundered up big time. But if there was one thing I think I've been wise about doing is trying to sound the call to people. Don't fall for the antics. Don't fall for the easy way. Don't fall for all this. It's like a pill. It's like a diet pill. It, it, it's so seductive in its appeal and allure because it's so easy that you succumb to it. The Christian way is, it's, it really is a strange paradox. It really is something that I'm not even sure I myself can articulate properly. When Jesus said, to those men on the shore, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. And I taught the message, follow me, I'll make you something you're not. But while they were with him, many times over we read that they didn't understand what he was saying and they didn't necessarily understand what, not only what he was saying, but what was about to happen. And it wasn't until the day of Pentecost when we'll call it the gift of clarity, understanding, wisdom that was poured out onto the church, equipment for service. And even then, that wasn't a guarantee that there wouldn't be errors made along the way of the same people who were blessed by God to be the first recipients, the first fruit of the outpouring on the day of Pentecost. And so I think to myself, I, I want to be able to say if there's at least one thing I was diligent at doing is sounding the call to people. And the people who have the capacity to listen are not going to judge my appearance because I'm wearing a hat or because I'm wearing dark clothes or because I wear makeup or because I'm a woman or because I talk fast or slow or in between. They're going to be listening to what I'm saying, going back into the book and saying, this is scriptural, this is biblical, this is an age-old problem. And just as Paul warned the Galatians, who hath bewitched you? I remember I taught on that as well. Who, the turncoats, who did this to you? Now in our case, for people who, as Hebrew says, have once been enlightened and have partaken of the heavenly gift, there's only one place you can look at. If we were to be asked, who hath bewitched you, you could certainly say that. The devil has been on the attack ever since. Why wouldn't he turn people away from this ministry and use every tactic, 
every single tactic. And still, and to date, the list goes on of, of tactics used. Have I ever said to you, to challenge us, I know the answer, have I ever said to you, I've never made a mistake in the pastorate here. In fact, I have stood in front of you and said I've blundered and sometimes quite, it's been a little bit humiliating. That's how you grow. You have to be able to look back and there were times that I, I recognize I was growing in front of you. There were things that I was wrestling and working out right in front of your eyes because I didn't have the years of preparation. And I thank God and I give glory to God that he let me work it out in front of you. If, you. if you cannot, in front of the family of God, with spiritual eyes, look on somebody who is genuinely striving, like Paul's instructing Timothy, to keep striving and pressing forward. And you can't look on that and say, the tenacity of the faith of that individual to keep pressing on in spite of the circumstances, in spite of the opposition, in spite of every possible obstacle, but yet, in my case, she persists. Before God, that's going to count for something. I don't know what, but it'll count for something. Because anybody else with just a little bit of pride or ego would, would say, well, this is too embarrassing for me. I trusted God implicitly. God was going to make a way. I, I, I told you I spent many nights on my knees with my Bible open, literally filling the pages with my tears. I mean, the, the paper would get crumpled after it dried, of just begging the Lord. I told you, at first I begged the Lord to take me away, to blot me out, because I, I, I didn't want to cause embarrassment or hurt the ministry or be fumbling around so badly. And then it was, Lord, enable me. If you're going to keep me here and you're going to leave me here, Without Dr. Scott, then excuse me, for God's sake, enable me, because I can't do it on my own. And that began a journey. But I never said to you, I'm perfect, and I've never made a mistake. And I've never looked at any of you when you have made a mistake and said, oh, well, see, the correction comes, and then I'm, I'm of the mind that if somebody has the right attitude, what are we talking about? Why are we wasting time discussing the issue? Come on, we've got matters of faith to go and tackle. That's been the way I've operated. So it's very easy for any of this to creep in, and it's very easy for some to say, well, it's not my responsibility. I don't have to warn people. I'll just stand here and smile and tell you good things that you want to hear, pleasurable things, things that make you happy. But these are things that should actually make you happy in a strange way. Because when you know the truth, and when you've received the truth, the truth makes you not only free and at liberty, but it also sets you free from fear that is triggered from Satan and fear that comes from the enemy planting those seeds. Let me go back to what I was just talking about me. Somebody said, well, well what, what, if, what if she can't, what if, what if this can't happen? What if that happens? What if she, what if what? Why is your focus on that? Why isn't your focus, I'm talking about 10 plus years ago, God? Because at the end of the day, it's not going to be about me. God either is in control or he's not. God is either called an individual or he hasn't. And that is always settled real quickly. Somebody said, well, why, don't, why doesn't God just remove certain ministries if they're not called? He does eventually. And sometimes he leaves people to linger a long time. It's called what I would say heaping up his own version of special coals reserved for that individual. That's not for me to judge. That's his work. That's his doing. Mine is just to put the call out and say, just as Jesus warned, there'll be wolves come in sheep's clothing. An age-old problem. Eat. It's good food. Eat of it. Partake. You won't die. 
it's an age-old problem. Now we know we have the antidote. We know who the enemy is. But I'm really trying to help those people who constantly sit and vacillate back and forth or who, who are desperately searching. This little book here, this little epistle, comes in like a breath of fresh air because just after talking about the children of Israel, it will pass on to even dealing with the angels, the fallen ones, and speaking of the punishment that awaits. It's, it's almost like Jude is giving a complete composition on this is what it looks like. And some were dealt with immediately and some will be dealt with later. Tell me, why is it that archaeologists are still trying to find and haven't with certainty identified, although there are two particular places people believe would be Sodom and Gomorrah, the area, the territory. Why is it difficult for them? Why do you think? Any idea? Because God, when he basically wiped these people off the map, he did it in such a way that there was nothing left. You know, there's, an, there's an archaeological interesting sidebar there I'm dying to go to, but I don't want to get sidetracked. I'm sorry. Focus. Focus. So I love that this is like a highlight, one by one, and it's counterbalanced with him saying to the kept, to the ones who've been called, who've been kept, and he'll continue that theme regarding the faith, contending for the faith, keeping yourselves, what does he say, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep, your, keep yourselves in the love of God, um, bookends to what's in the middle. This is, it's all, really, I have to say, this is what it just, it reminds me of, it's like a giant billboard. It's like a billboard. Be on the lookout, watch for this, keep faithing. That's, that's what this is. It's like a big billboard in a very small way, 25 verses. And it's, it is definitely something that, as I've said, nobody in the church really, I think, wants to do because who wants to say or who is fit to say? Now, listen, I don't, typically, I don't stand and point fingers. I say, if you want to follow that, be it the blind leading the blind, and if you're not well versed enough in the scriptures to say, well, is that person's doctrine right? Then I suggest you start studying and looking it up and don't take one passage and make that the whole thing to hang your hat on because I found one verse and therefore that's going to be my doctrine and I think it's sound. When he says crept in unaware is the side door, the side door is still being used today, folks. Don't think it's just something dated. But the Lord's people, they know who they are. They can make mistakes. They can be temporarily sheep led away and led astray. That does happen. And that's why I said the term here is vigilance, to keep in the faith and to keep faithing. Everything else almost becomes crystal clear when somebody says, no, you don't need to do that. Well, that's difficult. This is a much easier way. You know what I admire about Dr. Scott? He used to say hard way, easy way. That used to be the theme for almost every lesson, where, especially where he was usually dealing with staff. Hard way or easy way? Because it's easy to take the easy way. Again, one of these things that I've come to know God's wanting to know that we're willing to take the hard way. With our heart, we're willing to take the hard way. And as we go, it's not that it will be easy. It'll become easier because we know that's the way God has lined up our footsteps. So it's just a big warning. But to those who know why we're here and what we're doing, it's clear. Um, the danger is still there, and I'll keep 
lifting the banner and warning people about it. And somebody says, well, trust me, I've been put on a list of people. You know, somebody says, don't listen to women pastors, and they put me in a list with six other women pastors, and uh, of those other, sorry, it was six women pastors, I'm part of the six. I, one of them I don't even think is a woman. <laughs> Although I don't want to know. I don't even want to think about knowing. Two are dead. And the other one I'm just not sure that's made up of spare parts. So, um, you know, I haven't, have I led you in a women's conference lately? Have I told you about women's issues or women's rights? Have I troubled you about thoughts concerning anything that would be deemed, quote unquote, a woman's ministry? I've only come to you preaching the Bible. My sole interest is what's in God's book. And if it touches on things that happen to be there, then good. But I cannot say the same for the rest of the folks on that list who I know have all kinds of things that they do outside of what is supposedly a calling of God. But that's not my business. That's, that's God will take care of that. Mine is just to make sure that I'm putting out the call to people to pay attention. And if something doesn't sound right, you can always do one thing. Find enough scriptures. And when I say enough, the scripture confirms itself. You find enough scriptures, as I quoted tonight, I referenced out of Galatians and out of uh, Timothy, and there's out of Corinthians, and the list goes on, Second Peter. They're all saying the same thing. Out of the mouth of Jesus it was said, and in the Old Testament, as I said, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, certainly other minor prophets that spoke of the same thing. Hosea even makes mention of it himself. So, I'm not saying anything new. What I am saying, though, is it's important for me to have people around me who understand what the battle is. The battle isn't always going to be uh, to tell people, you know, and this is the battle right now, but the, the overall battle for all time will always be keeping these things out of the church. Oh, well, don't you want to get with the times? Don't you want all of the giving to be on some... Uh, E-device? You know, that that's, that'd make your life easier, Pastor Scott. Then people don't have to bring checks or wallets and they don't have to handle cash. Now listen, it's very practical and very pragmatic. But it's also, as I said, very antichrist. You know, you don't have to think about it. It's easier. What's the first thing that's going to happen when and it will happen when, com when a computer or computers cease to work. And they will eventually one day, um, even if it's in the event of a power failure, like a, an outage. We had, I told you, at a hotel, we traveling with the crew on the way to uh, Anguilla and having to touch down in Florida, and there's no power, and you can't get a room because the keys don't work, and the clerk at the desk can't even, there's no lights, and there's, you can't get anything. I couldn't even get a hotel I wanted to use another word to an adjective to describe a hotel room couldn't even get a hotel room because the computers were down so that's the power and you know no I'm sorry I'm not interested in being with the times I can there's a lot of things I can be in the times about but not not this because I recognize the peril, not just of being crippled for a moment, but the danger of data and data breaches. So, like I said, it's very easy. Somebody's very subtle suggestion. Oh, but you know that this would, somebody said, oh, this would increase giving exponentially. Really? Tell me how. How would it make somebody give more money if it was more convenient? No, actually, I want to make it harder for you. Do it the old way. And if you've got to put a stamp on it, put a stamp on it and put it in the mail. Well, that's pretty archaic. Well, then I guess I'm archaic. Yeah, I was talking about hard way, easy way. This is the same mindset, except it comes in as a subtle thing. So uh, don't expect any 
new changes to come from my side. I'm going to keep making the same calls and telling you about the same things and the call to be vigilant and keep the faith and keep faithing. Right now, I need you to keep getting busy by getting on the telephone.